what are the best habits that you recommend uh, for an academic and then also for a lay person to reduce the amount of bias? That's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to guardrails. And, and in the book, I talk about these reforms that have been introduced to improve the methodolo- methodology of psychology. Like um, if I do an experiment where I give you a pill and I check your health readings before and after the pill, but I check 25 different aspects of your health, uh, blood pressure, depression, anxiety, statistically, there will be some difference in something pre and post. Because if you test enough things statistically, there'll be some difference. If you put guardrails on that and you force me to make a hypothesis, like I think this pill will improve Coleman's blood pressure or whatever, that makes it much harder for me to convince myself or others that I found something when nothing's there. And I think like the rationalist community is pretty good about this. Like they will force one another to make very precise predictions about what they really think that you can't really fudge later on. It'll even be like, you know, put a percentage on it. How how sure are you that this thing is true? So I think getting in habits like that can really help to fight bias because the more, the more freedom we have to sort of tell bullshit stories and like pretend we said Y when we really said X, those are the environments in which uh, bias really festers. Mm. Yeah. So I want to talk about the implicit association test. Um, That's a big topic in your book. And I think it's in the introduction, you say it's the topic that sort of launched the rest of the book as the maybe most salient and most controversial example of, of an effect that was hugely and continues to be hugely overhyped. Yeah. So can you talk about the origins of the implicit association test? What is the test? Who came up with it? And what were its initial promises? Yeah, so in 1998, the University of Washington holds this press conference and Mazarin Banaji, she's now at Harvard, and Anthony Greenwald, uh, still at the University of Washington, they announced they've come up with this test that can reveal people's unconscious bias. And uh, it's basically based on a priming theory. So if you go to the Harvard's, Harvard's Project Implicit website, you'll be told, uh, you sit down, you take the test, hit I if you see a good word or a, black, a white face, hit E if you see a black face or a bad word, or you switch that. And there's an algorithm that basically calculates how easy it is for you to correct, connect white faces with positive words versus black faces with negative words or vice versa. So if it's easy for me to connect a photo of a black guy with a word like uh, illness or distress or whatever the negative words are, the theory is I'm implicitly biased against black people. And early on, the creators of the test said that it did a remarkably good job at predicting behavior. So if you get a high score on the black-white IAT, which means you're biased against black people, that means you're going to act biased against them in the real world, or you're more likely to. Uh, There are other versions of the test. You can take tests that measure your bias against um, fat people or women or other groups, but the black-white IAT has been the real blockbuster. Uh, So for years, people took this test and they were, there's this whole subgenre of like, uh, anecdote where you take the test and then you post to Facebook or Twitter. Wow. I, I've got a lot of learning to do about my implicit biases. It turns out I'm biased against black people. I'm, I'm ashamed of this. It became this real sociological phenomenon. The problem is we still don't know exactly what it's actually measuring because a, a, a difference in reaction time between different stimuli is suggestive of something. But that's not bias in itself. That doesn't prove that that actually corresponds to real world behavior. There's some evidence that the implicit bias actually measures familiarity with certain narratives. So an important early paper critiquing it was called Would Jesse Jackson Fail the Implicit Association Test? And the logic is Jesse Jackson is well aware of anti-black racism. That could give him a high score on the IAT. And while there, so there's some patterns like, like white people do score higher than black people. Overall, it's like an incredibly noisy test. You get very different results if you take it and then take it again. And uh, as of 2015, even the test creators have said this is too noisy for us to use to diagnose individuals as being likely to engage in racist acts. So in my view, the the central provocative premise of the test has completely fallen apart. Why isn't the fact that white people on average score higher 
by itself proof that the test is measuring racism? Um, I think it tells us something interesting, but there's just a lot of potential confounds there. Like if a lot of, based on my understanding, if a lot of ardently anti-racist whites take the test, I think there's some evidence that could actually lead to a higher score because you're so aware of these the downtroddenness of black people mm. in this worldview. Uh, right. That could lead to a higher uh, score. So there's so many potential confounds that I don't think that proves anything on its own. I do think it's suggestive that this is like interesting and whatever they're measuring is more interesting than if it was totally random and there were no patterns. But when you look at some of the research that has been done, trying to probe the question of what's being measured there, it seems to be a lot more complicated than just implicit bias. And, and I think I, I might be missing the forest for the trees here. Most importantly, if you correlate implicit association test scores with quote unquote racist behavior in lab settings, a tiny correlation, like it's statistically significant, but it's just not a useful predictor of anything. Mm. So that means if I score, I mean, there, there's also the reliability problem, the test retest yeah. reliability problem. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. That just means if you, if you take the test and then take it again later, you'll get a significantly different score. And by any normal standards of what psychologists call psychometric instruments, this test is way too weak to be used in professional settings. Like if, if, right. if you have the same numbers for a anxiety or depression test, researchers would just throw it out because you can't use a test that noisy. Right. It's, it's, it's as if, as if an IQ test or an SAT that I took today and tomorrow, I got, I just got wildly different scores. Like I'm yeah. a, that, that's pretty normal when it comes to IAT. That, that is the norm. It's the norm. You know, I don't want to exaggerate. It would be like a SAT giving you a 1500 versus a 1300. So maybe both right. above average scores, but very different within that band. Yeah. Right. So, um, I want to drill down more on, on this, the notion of uh, implicit bias. Yeah. Um, you know, one question is we're talking about bias that's unconscious, right? Bias that you actually don't know you're experiencing. Yeah. Is it, possible to use your conscious mind to alter your unconscious mind? Do we know how to do that? Or is that, <laughs> yeah. is that, is that in some sense a contradiction, right? Because if it's unconscious to begin with, is it possible to access that and alter it with, with our conscious minds in, for instance, a, a, a workplace setting with, with right. a PowerPoint or, a, or an exercise? It, so Part of the problem here is like the the people who created the IAT, I, I do not think they've been that deft philosophically explaining exactly what they mean about unconscious bias. They are sometimes fuzzy about that. The studies we have suggest that there are, assuming what is being measured is unconscious bias, there are some interventions that can reduce your score on the IAT. There's no evidence that that score reduction leads to any change in behavior beyond the context of the IIT. So the strict answer to your question, can conscious activity re uh, change your unconscious mind, uh, is yes, in the yeah. IIT context. I also think that like the brain is such a pattern matching machine and we form associations in such a specific way that it seems pretty obvious that if you consciously attempted to form some association by like pairing two images mm -hmm. or uh, some kind of Pavlovian training, like you hear a bell and then uh, someone brings ice cream, stuff like that. There's definitely ways you could hack your mind to, to use in conscious ways to generate unconscious effects. I think that's pretty clear. 